All right, I'm now <clears throat> up to the uh, 3 p.m. turn on the first day at Gettysburg. As you can see, uh, quite a few things have continued to develop here, although um, still has not been a concentrated Confederate attack on the whole Union line, uh, mainly because I've been focusing on bringing out my artillery for the Confederates. Um, the artillery has uh, moved on to um, more offensive positions now for the Confederates. Um, probably one of the main reasons that my uh, initial attacks with Heath Division fared so poorly over here was because I kind of just pushed ahead with the infantry um, before I brought the artillery online to um, try and soften up the Union position. And part of that was because um, the, the artillery was not going to be particularly effective against the, the cavalry and skirmish formation. Um, that, to me, that just seemed like it would have been a waste of ammo. <clears throat> but my problem was I uh, ended up pushing forward with Heath's infantry um, into the cavalry, the Union cavalry, and then into some of the First Corps units, and it was against those First Corps units where um, the Heath's brigades ended up taking a lot of, of damage that they probably could have avoided had they waited a bit and uh, waited for the artillery to come up. But I was going under a Confederate strategy of pushing hard with Heath's division as opposed to, um, you know, taking their time, bringing the artillery up, waiting for um, Pender's division to arrive. Uh, so, you know, that you, that those are the, the risks that you take when you're going to push forward aggressively uh, and not do a more um, plotted uh, offensive maneuver. So, you know, in terms of units lost, um, the Confederates and the Union are actually pretty even at the moment. And in terms of brigade effectiveness, um, the Union is doing much better. Uh, as you can see, you've got... Uh, Perrin's South Carolina Brigade is ineffective. Um, this was Lane back here rallying guys. His, his troops are actually up here. Um, they're still okay. Uh, Archer, one of the first brigades to go combat ineffective. Uh, Brock and Rowe, also combat ineffective. And Davis back here, combat ineffective. So you've got four, uh, actually five Confederate brigades that are completely ineffective compared to currently one Union Brigade now that is combat effective and that was Rowley's um, brigade in the First Corps and fortunately Rowley was wounded or captured, one of the two, I forget which, um, and uh, that was actually good because his replacement is a better commander than he was. Uh, he was one of the zero commanders that can't rally troops unless he's sitting right on top of them. Um, so, and Rowley's brigade was the weakest in the Union Army. Uh, historically, they were way over here on the left, and uh, part of the reason that the Iron, Iron Brigade got forced off of McPherson's Ridge because uh, Rowley's brigade ended up breaking under the slightest of pressure. So, um, they're, you know, they've had a little better showing here. They lasted until 3 p.m., which I believe is longer uh, than they lasted historically. So, but they're also in a different spot in the line. Uh, as you can see, kind of just under these two stacks, I've got Doubleday himself over there to help rally um, any of the shaky units. Probably the, the currently the strongest brigade, and it looks like there's only three regiments. I'm not sure if that's historically correct or not, but this is Stone's brigade of the First Corps. Um, it looks like it's just these three regiments here, which seems small to me. I don't know, maybe one got eliminated. No, I could have got eliminated because the point that I was going to make was that this is the strongest brigade in the uh, in the first corps right now. Um, they've only taken one casualty uh, compared to uh, all the other brigades, which have taken at least three casualties. Um, here's Paul. He hasn't taken too much damage yet. And then Baxter is over here on the extreme left. Um, He's, he hasn't taken much damage, but he's got very small and fairly low morale regiments. Um, 
so they're not they're not particularly effective and they did lose a battery up there um, when the crew was killed so you know this and another problem that I'm running into with the the Union artillery that's um, concentrated mainly in these two spaces here I've got some here um, for the first core it's running out of ammo and the big, the big problem is you can only refill uh, artillery with the core train, the core supply train, not these divisional supply trains uh, that are back here. These guys are only good for small arms. So that's a problem because one of these batteries here is out of ammo and you know I was trying to preserve my ammunition for the main infantry charge. Um, I did do take a couple of shots to do some counter battery fire because the Confederates have artillery in this whole line here and then all along here. And that was a big problem historically, um, why the First Corps you know, was unable to, to hold the defensive position along these ridges because they were massively outgunned in artillery because the Union Reserve artillery um, had not arrived on the field yet. Um, so all they had to deal with was core artillery, whereas the um, the Confederacy with their much larger cores had their core artillery plus their divisional artillery. Um, so that, that just left way more guns on the Confederate side um, than for the Union. Although the majority of the Confederate artillery is all along this line here. Um, I do have some divisional artillery scattered in here with Rhodes' division. And then down here with Early's division, which you can see has moved onto the map. I've got a couple of brigades that are going to cross over here and try and get around the Union flank. Um, and probably successfully, because I'm sure these weak 11th Corps units will probably have broken um, and fallen back towards the town by then. I did historically, as Howard did historically, keep uh, von Steinler's division back here on Cemetery Hill, the Smith's Brigade, and I sent... Uh, uh, Coster's Brigade over here to Culp's Hill uh, because I'm definitely anticipating an attempt by the Confederates to to advance quickly uh, across this open ground uh, east of the town. So I wanted to keep the two the two um, higher Union positions um, or the two the two high ground positions here in Union hands for as long as I can. So hopefully with the uh, the artillery. Uh, most of the 11th Corps artillery is also back here on Cemetery Hill. I did send up two batteries. And there's a battery here and a battery here um, at the other end of the Union line um, for whatever good it will do. Uh, we'll see. There is the 11th Corps supply train coming on, which is good. Um, I wish it was the 1st Corps supply train, but the 1st Corps supply train won't be on until much later, um, probably long after this uh, this day one stuff um, has been resolved so uh, that's kind of where things stand the union at least here you know there's no salient on Barlow's Knoll Barlow's Knoll is actually way up here as you can see I, I stuck played prudently with the uh, the 11th core line and hooked them right into the first core line I don't know how well that's gonna hold uh, once the Confederates start running low on ammo from their bombardment here um, the infantry is going to advance, and uh, it's just going to be a matter of time there because uh, they'll just have the weight of numbers. Hopefully, uh, the Union troops can um, inflict some serious damage on the Confederates in that in that process. Maybe render some more uh, of the Confederate brigades combat ineffective. I've got Pettigrew here. Um, his brigade is probably going to be close to combat ineffective. Um, if they take a couple more hits, um, and Thomas and Lane um, have both taken some damage as well, um, that will probably um, lead to combat in, uh, ineffectiveness on their part too. So uh, that's the one bright spot is that the, the Union left um, is not going to have the pressure on it that the Union right's going to have. Um, I just shudder to think what's going to happen to this 11th Corps line. Um, once Early gets his men up online and in position and gets hit by Early from this side, he's got way more guys and much larger regiments and uh, most of Rhodes' guys on this side. So I've got some First Corps units that are in pretty good shape except for Rowley. Um, it's unfortunate that his brigade is where it is 
because um, that's kind of they're, they're sort of the link to the eleventh core. Um, but at this point, I don't really have time to move them off the line um, and try and close this up here um, without losing my link to the first core over here. As you can see, the railroad cut goes through there, and I don't I didn't even put guys in here because um, when they're in the cut, they're such a disadvantage to the guys on either side. Um, it just turns the railroad cut into no man's land, even though historically uh, troops from both the Confederate side and the Union side were constantly moving guys along this because it provided this cover um, from fire uh, from any distance except adjacent to it. But the problem is once you're in there and you get somebody adjacent to you, it's a death trap. So um, it just becomes no man's land in the game. Uh, you know, I almost wish... Uh, the games just wouldn't even have the railroad cut in there. Um, I think the because you're just it's it becomes this thing where yeah historically people used it but tactically in a game nobody wants to use it because it doesn't convey uh, any any perceived advantage. You know guys blundered into it historically because they thought there was an advantage and then found out oh no there isn't we're stuck here and they have to surrender or they're killed or whatever. So. Um, I, I think the line of battle, uh, Last Chance for Victory, does a little bit better job of, uh, of addressing the railroad cut and not making it, making it something that you could move through um, as opposed to something that just in game terms you end up wanting to completely avoid altogether uh, to the point where you don't even want to move any units into it, which creates its own, you know, ahistorical problem of this dead space on the battlefield that, that wasn't really there, so... Anyway, that's where we are, um, 3 p.m. turn, getting closer to the end of day one.